Did someone in your party attempt to cast astral projection or plane shift and you had no idea where they were going to go? Or maybe you're at a point where in your DMing uh, career that you'd like to explore planar travel but don't really have the knowledge base that you feel is necessary to run that. Stick around and let's talk about it. Welcome back to the Game Masters Academy. This is the show where we strive to help you make every one of your sessions great. Thank you for joining me. My name is Greg. The episode today, uh, I just actually got back from a little mini vacation that I had, and I was inspired to take on a little bit of a bigger project. I had a a much-needed little bit of a rest and a respite from work and whatnot, and One of the things that I realized I don't have a ton of knowledge with is just the planes in D&D settings and how they work and, you know, did some research and there's inner planes and outer planes and transient planes and there's all sorts of stuff going on, but it generally speaking actually breaks down pretty easily. And so that's what we're going to go ahead and do. What my plan is, is very similar to the dungeon where I'm going to create a series of episodes that all work off of each other. Uh, I'm gonna do the same thing for planar travel. We're gonna call the whole entire thing the Game Master's Guide to the Planes. Uh, It's gonna be uh, just some basic information. This first episode is gonna go over the, just the idea and the overall uh, way that the planes are organized. And then we'll probably take a look at each one of them individually and how they interact with the material plane or just the the standard place that you would uh, start your traditional D&D campaign on uh, and go from there. Uh, This is gonna be, uh, I think it's gonna be a little bit more focused on just the audio. I had that dungeon um, set up to really kind of almost need a visual. Uh, In order to be able to talk about a room, you kind of have to know where that room is so that way you can then understand what it is that we're talking about. And so that worked out uh, pretty well for YouTube. But uh, this one's just going to be a little bit more uh, audio um, going through what each of them are and how it all works. And so that is the overall goal for the series that we're going to be running here. Uh, Before we get into today's episode, uh, I just wanted to say uh, all the same stuff that I always do. Uh, Like, subscribe, any of the interactions that you can provide for the podcast, for the YouTube channel, anything along those lines obviously helps get the uh, show out there and is greatly appreciated. And so I appreciate everyone that does that. Also, I feel like I may have jumped the gun a little bit on the whole idea of Patreon. Um... I was just looking at it as an extra way to provide additional materials uh, that doesn't seem to be a huge demand for that type of stuff right now. And so I, uh, I'm entertaining the idea of uh, shutting that down temporarily, potentially opening it back up. But uh, that is something that's uh, being kind of kicked around. It does exist. It's there. There's some stuff on it for uh, individuals. If it's something you're interested in, uh, feel free. I may keep it going just... Um, uh, have it, you know, kind of exist in the background and not really worry about it that much. But I just wanted to uh, to put that out there as well. All right. So with that all out of the way, let's get into the planes as just a general overview. So we start off on the material plane in your traditional Faerun Forgotten Realms type of a setting. The planet, which is just like any other planet, is Toril. T-O-R-I-L. And it is a singular planet within the solar system. Uh, That solar system has a star, uh, has a sun. And it it basically works the same kind of concept as what Earth would. There are two planes that are around or directly connected to the material plane. And that is the Feywild and Shadowfell. Now, these are mirror planes, and what that means is a location that exists on the material plane has a reflection that exists in the Feywild as well as in the Shadowfell. Uh, They are, I don't want to say they're extreme opposites, they're just different. And so the Feywild reflection of a mountain 
may be this ginormous crystalline structure that caps every single one of the peaks and has the light from the ever setting sun shining through it and basically refracted out into a rainbow that causes those peaks to shed this almost like angelic and rainbow-like quality in the space around it. That same space in the shadow fell may be chopped off and the, the mountain range may no longer be majestic and it's just jagged outcroppings and when looked at from a great distance they may resemble a skeleton or bones, something along those lines. So you've got these two reflective planes. Uh, the Fey Wild is uh, typically ruled by a uh, the two courts of the the Sealy and the Unsealy. So the Sealy are what you would consider like the summer court or the summer Fey, and then the Unsealy courts are the winter Fey. I guess is the easiest way to put it. They are opposites. Uh, I think evil and good is a incorrect way of looking at them. Uh, they. Uh, they share their season, I think, is the best way of looking at it. And that's this isn't just like a D and D thing. This is something from uh, history. And um, I guess what I mean by that is when you look at literature throughout history, the Sealy, the Unsealy, the you know the Land of Fairy, uh, Fey in general has a long-standing, uh, deep-rooted history throughout the. Um, existence of the world. And uh, I, so that's kind of what the Feywild is supposed to represent, is supposed to represent the D&D version of that, basically, where the, you have these two opposing courts that are held by the, the queens of the two courts are uh, bitter uh, and jealous of each other, and they're constantly manipulating, but not going to all-out war, although sometimes they do. Uh, I think a really great depiction of how Fey kind of works uh, is uh, handled exceptionally well by uh, James Butcher or Jim Butcher. I mean, uh, in the Dresden Files. So anybody that's read that, um, the way that that's done there is is done exceptionally well. And so what I mean by that is, you know, the Winter Fey are not particularly evil, though they are cruel and emotionless, like Winter itself. And the Summer Fey are definitely not good. But they are uh, cheery and mirthful and um, upbeat and bright. And so they, mo they both would uh, try to deceive. They would both try to create a deal that would punish the other recipient. Uh, and so, it, like I said, it's pulling in a lot from you know, Lovecraft and Tolkien and all of these different authors throughout the history of the world. So that's the Feywild. And then Shadowfell is like the dark, gloomy, it's not so much the underworld, but it is a dark, gloomy, and desolate place that is filled with vampires, necromancers, and undead. Uh, for an example, uh, Neverwinter has a mirrored city within the Shadowfell that is called Evernight. And there are living that are there, there's vampires, there's undead, but the ruling cast of the city, the ones that are in charge and are the, you know, majority are a cast of flesh-eating ghouls that oversee everything within the city. And so you can kind of see how they are not so, the Feywild and Shadowfell are not so much opposites of each other, but more just different reflections of the material plane. And that is why they are called the reflective realms or the mirrored realms uh, because they share those types of um, uh, same locations exist in both or there is a reflection of a location that exists in both of the realms or all three of the realms I should say uh, also referred to as maybe it's as an echo so from that we then get into what is known as the transitive planes. So there's two. The ethereal plane and the astral plane are mostly featureless planes, and they are typically used as pathways and or uh, different locations to travel from one 
plane to the next. So the astral plane is a giant uh, sea of silvery light and within it are reflective pools of different colored lights and those actually end up being portals to the other planes that we're, we're going to talk to here in a second. And then the ethereal plane exists like the border ethereal exists throughout the fey the material and shadowfowl and so you could be in a border material and you potentially could use that version of the ethereal to traverse through the different um, material planes and its echoes so both of those are something that we'll get into um, in significantly more detail, but th they're mainly transitive or used for travel or traversing to uh, other planes of existence. The overall way that this looks, we're going to come back to once we've talked about the inner and the outer planes uh, and how that interacts with the astral plane, which is rather important when it comes to like a spell jammer campaign and or traversing from because again if, if we're, we're talking about a multiverse then that means that there are other planets that have a sun there might be a sun with five planets around it or whatever and you would then be able to travel from your planet out through the astral plane to a different planet and there's a you know obviously different ways that you would be able to uh, make that uh, travel. Now, the way that this is organized, the material plane has a space between the planet or the you know actual toril um, and the echoes that have uh, from it, uh, Shadowfell as well as Feywild. Uh, there's this space around it, which is where the inner planes exist. Then there's something that's called wild space. And then there's an astral shell that exists around that. And on the outside of the astral shell is where the outer planes exist. And this is the way that it works around every astral shell or every other star system. So if you were to do your whole spell jammer thing and you were gonna go from your specific location to a different solar system, then you would have to go out of your astral shell, then you would traverse the astral plane, you would find a different astral shell, you would burrow through it, and then you'd be able to get into that particular solar system. And so that's the way that this is designed to work. All of the space between the material plane and the astral shell is called wild space. That is what we would typically think of when we think of outer space. And so there's no air, uh, there's no gravity, and that's where it is uh, chaotic. And then once you've breached your astral shell and you're into the astral sea, then somehow gravity uh, comes back and you're able to breathe, but travel is a little wonky. So you, you move, it's all by thought. And so you move based on your intelligence score, not your modifier, your actual score, um, and that is individuals that are extremely intelligent are able to traverse the space easier and so they'd be able to move faster. Uh, and so the astral sea has its own you know, thing. Like I said, we'll, we'll get into the astral plane into details, but I just kind of wanted to go over this idea. And so I think the easiest way to visualize this is think of um, a planet with rings. So Saturn or Jupiter or anything along those lines. And every one of those gas giants has a solid core of some kind. Well, at least we expect that they do. And that is the material plane. And then the actual gaseous body where it's super hazardous and crazy is wild space. And that's where the inner planes exist. Once you have breached through to the exterior portion and you're into the ring, that's where the outer planes exist. And that ring has a river that goes through it, the river Styx, and it touches every single one of the planes. And so you can get a ferryman to ferry you down the river Styx to the plane that you want to go to, and uh, then you'd be able to visit that plane. And so that's a very similar idea kind of visually to that. And so just imagine that 
let's use Jupiter, that you have this planet, you have rings, because Jupiter does have a very faint ring going around it, and within that ring are a bunch of moons, and each one of those moons is its own plane. It's the easiest way to kind of visualize, I think, the way that they have it all set up. So that's great. We talked about inner planes, we talked about outer planes, so let's actually talk about what they are. So the inner planes are the planes that are, oh, let's think of the easiest way, the essential materials for the creation of the material plane, or what is known as just the elements. So there's four inner planes of air, earth, fire, and water. And those four inner planes are the materials that were used to create the material plane and its echoes, and they exist around the general location of the material plane, and they do slightly overlap. So, for instance, the plane of fire and the plane of earth have a small overlap area where there are tons of crazy, ridiculous volcanoes. And so, again, obviously, the volcanoes there are a mixture of both earth and fire. Whereas the uh, er, plane of earth and the plane of water, where they overlap, is a very silty and swampy uh, marsh and bog uh, because, of again, of those two kind of combined forces. Now, when we refer to them, uh, we are always talking about the areas of the planes of air, earth, fire, and water that are closest not geographically, because you can't just like walk there, uh, but they're closest uh, to them metaphorically, uh, the material plane. So the far distant reaches of the plane of Earth have no air, are solid rock, and the far distant places of the plane of air have no land, are all air, and you would just fall for eternity. And so we are looking at, as we bring these planes together, they're coalescing all into one space is what creates the actual material uh, plane itself. If we extend our distance um, metaphorically speaking, from the material plane, even to the farthest extents of where the inner planes exist, the pure distinctive elements dissolve the borders between them and kind of bleed together into this like clashing energy and colliding substance that is referred to as the elemental chaos. Uh, weird hybrids can be found here, so you could find like this weird hybrid where there's an uh, elemental of both earth and fire, or even elementals that are completely opposite of each other. Somehow you could have a elemental of fire and water that are here, as just all of the different elemental energies themselves bleed together. And this is where the beginnings of that wild space that I was talking about start to exist. It's just chaos and extremely dangerous and if you continue pushing you basically fall into or you know get into the void space that exists before you hit your astral shell following or extending beyond the astral shell we get into the the outer planes now a lot of these are uh, the I guess the easiest way to put it is a lot of the outer planes are made up based on their philosophies and how they're different from each other. And so that has a lot to do with alignment. Uh, so like the seven heavens of Mount Celestia, for example, uh, is aligned with lawful good. And so the blessed fields of Elysium are neutral good. And so it's showing the difference between that lawful good and the neutral good that exists within the planes and within the pantheon. 
Whereas like the wilderness of the beast lands is neutral good and chaotic good kind of mixed together and uh, you know overlapping each other. So the outer planes are much less to do with the forces of creation for D and D and much more to do with the philosophies that kind of guide those forces of creation or guide those uh, other forces. On the Outer Plains, there are 16, and they are devolved into two groups. They are devolved into the Upper Plains and the Lower Plains, and that is based on the alignment that the plane most easily goes with. And by that, what I mean is the Evil Plains are going to be the Lower Plains, and the Good Aligned Plains will be the upper planes. Now, there is a little bit of overlap here. And one of the things that we'll notice is most of the neutral planes will have a secondary idea that comes with it. So like, for instance, Bitopia, which is the twin paradise. So the twin paradises of Bitopia is neutral good and lawful good. And so that would distinguish it as a uh, upper plane. Uh, the you know Isgard, the heroic domains of Isgard, is chaotic neutral. Well, okay, that doesn't really fall into evil or uh, good. So they put a an additional distinction on here that it's also chaotic good to distinguish it from pandemonium, which is chaotic neutral and chaotic evil. And so a lot of the neutral based type planes have that additional distinction on there to show you whether it is a uh, upper or lower plane. Uh, most of these are things that you've probably heard of uh, in passing. Limbo, Pandemonium, the Abyss, the Nine Hells of Bador, uh, Mechanis, which is the Clockwork Nirvana, um, Arcadia. So there's a lot of these different um, outer planes that you get to once you have breached the astral shell that is surrounding the material plane for the campaign that you're on. And every one of those planes has layers. Obviously, it's defined in some of them, like the nine layers of hell. Not, it's in the name. But the uh, Mount Celestia resembles a seven-tiered layer cake, like a wedding cake almost. And so you have to ascend up because it's an upper plane, whereas the nine layers of hell, you descend down into the uh, to the deepest regions of the hell. Whereas others at the same time have no defined amount of layers, like the abyss has a seemingly infinite number of layers to it. So the planes themselves all exist and then you have dominions, uh, which also kind of float around, which are little tiny like pocket dimensions, which is like where the gods reside. And so like a cleric has a domain. And that's what they mean by that. You, if you're, you know, worshiping uh, Kelimbor, then he has his own little domain, uh, dominion type extra planar space that exists outside of that that is his that he rules from basically and as you get into the astral plane and you're able to see within the astral plane it's considered to be the astral sea is a sea of silver white uh, water is basically what it kind of looks like and as you look into it you will find reflective pools that shimmer in a specific color and each one of the planes the outer planes has a specific color that represents it or that is correlated to that. It does bring up an interesting question that if you are playing a character that is colorblind and you're trying to do planar travel, how would you know which pool of light to go to if you cannot distinguish them? But that's a question for a different uh, time. You know, actually, that would be an interesting uh, way to create a, ca a character that accidentally appeared on the material plane. He was attempting to go to some specific place and just kind of went into the wrong pool because he's colorblind, and now he's trapped on the material plane. I don't know. Sounds like it'd be an interesting idea. So just like there is the river Styx that is uh, able to 
you know, go through the top layers of all these different um, planes and then has tributaries into a lot of the other ones. So, for, like, for instance, um, the River Styx traverses every one of the layers of the Nine Hells, a tributary does, and that's your main way of travel through that particular outer plane. But the River Styx itself goes through the majority of the lower planes, so it's going to hit the top layers of Acheron, the Nine Hells, Gehenna, Hades, Carceri, the Abyss, and Pandemonium, and then tributaries of it snake their way through all of the lower levels of those planes. And just like there is the River Styx that typically is going to be going through the lower planes, there is something called the Infinite Staircase that is connected to the planes as well. Uh, I, th it's very it's very much a how you want to do it is the right way, but it seems like the River Styx is for the lower planes and then tributaries travel deeper into them. And the Infinite Staircase is for the upper planes, and as you go up the stairs, you go up into the layers of the upper planes as well. Uh, but again, it's kind of like a, there isn't a right way to do it. You kind of get to pick how you want it to work. But the uh, Infinite Staircase is uh, often tucked into the Material Plane or to a different plane, and then that's how you are able to grant uh, access to traversing the Outer Planes. They're guarded. Most of the gateways and portals and river sticks and things like that are guarded by uh, powerful uh, monsters, whether it's Divas or Sphinxes, Yugoloths, things along those lines. And so the infinite staircase has the idea where no two steps share the same gravitational orientation. And there's all sorts of other, you know, just, um, I guess the, the easy other quirks that you can place within uh, the infinite staircase itself. It is its own, its own extra dimensional space as well. So that is the basic overview of what the planes are designed to look like with the basic rule set that is within uh, the D&D. So you have the material plane and its echoes, just as for a review here. Material plane and its echoes, the Feywild and the Shadowfell. You have the transient planes, which is the astral plane as well as the ethereal plane, including the border and the deep ethereal the astral plane uh, is the way that you get to the outer planes. And when you're doing that, you have the material plane, its echoes. You have the inner planes, which are the forces of creation. As you get further and further away from them, metaphorically speaking, not geographically speaking, as you get further away from those elemental forces, you get into elemental chaos and then eventually breach into the wild space, which is typically what we would consider outer space. And then if you continue, you will reach what's called the astral shell. And by breaching the astral shell, you get into the astral sea, which is where it is all about thought. But you are able to breathe. There is an, a semblance of gravity, uh, things along those lines. And then from the astral sea is how you achieve access to the outer planes, which are almost like a physical representation of a philosophy. And so those outer planes are geared more towards the alignment of the plane than the physical forces that could potentially exist. And so whereas if like you're in the plane of earth, there is a physical place that you can be standing. Your body is there. And that place is going to have Tao, genie, that are the rulers. There's tons of gemstones. It's just very opulent and just all over the place. Again, we'll get into that. But then when you go into places that are more philosophical, like the, the beast lands, for instance, it's less about you having a physical entity there and more about you traversing this space that is almost like your thought process and uh, your 
physical body may not wholly be involved in that idea. So that's where the outer planes exist. And then all of this exists around every uh, typical setting. So for instance, if you were to go to the planet Kryn, which is the setting for the Dragonlance campaign, they have a material plane. They have a Feywild and a Shadowfell as echoes that are specific to that location, as well as inner planes and outer planes. And those outer planes may have different names, but share the same general idea. And so you would breach through the astral shell to get to the outer planes, to, uh, to get to the uh, outer planes and the astral sea. And then if you chose, you could traverse the astral sea and go over to Greyhawk and breach through the astral uh, shell to get into the wild space and then into the inner planes and then finally get onto the material plane of Greyhawk. And so that's kind of the idea behind multiversal travel within uh, D&D. And so again with the, you know, like a multiverse type idea, every one of those is its own separate entity in space. And that's why a lot of times when we're looking at the Pantheon, each Pantheon is unique for the setting that it's in. So the gods in Greyhawk are all different names than the gods on Toril. And that's because those gods exist around the astral shell of that specific material plane. And then there's different gods that exist around the specific astral shell around Toril or your traditional Forgotten Realms setting. And that is your planar overview. So like I said, what my plan is, I'm going to go into a little bit of details on what each of these planes are as well as how they work because it gives us a good baseline knowledge so that way if we wanted to add our own additional plane or if we're homebrewing an entire campaign setting and we want to create planes that are uh, unique to that campaign setting, we at least have an idea of a way that it can be done effectively. I appreciate each and every one of you for taking the time out of your day to spend with me. I hope that you learned a little bit more about the planes of the multiverse and how exactly your characters or your campaign is are able to interact with them. And I hope you have a great rest of your week. And as always, let's let the dice decide.